uh, Ken Hansen's accomplishments are legendary. He's a former uh, U.S. Congressman, former Texas State Senator. Uh, chair, he was chair of the Texas Railroad Commission, uh, and he, he was the former chancellor, is the former chancellor of Texas Tech. And I would uh, say that he's the most impactful leader uh, in the history of uh, Texas Tech. And, uh, you know, and I hope you, you've uh, subscribed to his podcast, Ken Hance, the best storyteller in Texas. Uh, it is a, is a great podcast. I've heard a lot of those stories through the years, and I, I've, I, I love to listen to him. And, and he, uh, anyway, do yourself a favor and, and subscribe uh, to that podcast. You'll enjoy it very much, and you'll enjoy him uh, uh, this morning. So uh, please welcome the Honorable Ken Hance. Thank you to Ron Butler and First Financial and Scott Deezer, and, and that's a good organization, and, and uh, I enjoy doing business with them. I hadn't done a thousand projects with them, though. They, they might not have introduced me if I'd done a thousand projects with them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to kind of visit the, uh, uh, I was a home builder at one time in the 70s. I was state senator in a practicing attorney, and I guess I thought I didn't have enough to do, and I was busy, and so I started a little home building business, and somebody asked me one time, did you make any money in the home building business? I did, I made a lot of money, because as a lawyer, I got first dabs on the, on the DWIs that my subs got. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how I made money, helped help my law business. And uh, I got elected to Congress, still had the home building business, and sold it. And Jimmy Carter got elected, and, and uh, interest rates went to uh, 17, 18 percent. Of course, the poor guy that bought me out, he didn't last long. Uh, it was a bad time. The, uh, uh, I don't know why, but I think of that period of time with Carter during the uh, a lot of the things that happen now is kind of amateur hour. And uh, I hope I don't offend anybody, but uh, that's, that's the way I feel about it. Uh, they asked me to talk to you, and I have just Google or Spotify or iHeart, any of them, Ken Hance, best storyteller in Texas. Uh, we've done them, a lot of them have been doing them for over a year. In March, last time I looked, we had 39,000 people uh, hit and listened in, in March. And it'll, it'll show you the countries and show you the cities. Uh, Houston's number one, uh, Dallas two, Austin three, Lubbock four, because you know, I'm from Lubbock. And, and, uh, but the Islamic Republic of Iran had nine people listening to my podcast. And my wife thought that maybe they were been sentenced to prison and they were putting some cruel and unusual punishment on them, made them listen. And there were like, like 15 people in Belgium, you know, and, and so many people in Germany. There were in countries where there's in Libya or Algeria or uh, in, uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, where there's oil and gas explanation, there, there would be, the numbers would go up. Uh, but some of these stories, if you go back and, and listen, I, I, I do them on Mondays, but there's a library, and you can go back and listen to all of them. But on Mondays, and they're about 15 to 20 minutes. Some people have a podcast that will go an hour. Most people are going to be at work by, you know, not take an hour to drive, but it allows you to kind of relax. And I, I want to share a little this morning about some of the colorful people I've met along the way. And uh, that, uh, uh, that I picked out three. Uh, one was uh, uh, State Senator Babe Swartz from Galveston. Swartz and I rarely ever voted the same way. He was liberal and I was conservative, but he was a colorful guy and kind of fun to be around. He, uh, this story is, a, a, he was a, 
a young district attorney, assistant district attorney. He's 27, and he, he went down to the sheriff's office one day, went running to the sheriff's office, and the sheriff said, uh, Swartz came in and said, I gotta have a gun, I gotta have a gun. And he said, why do you need a gun? He said, look at this letter. And he got a letter, it's real short to the point. It said, dear Mr. Swartz, I'm going to kill you. Wasn't signed. And the uh, sheriff looked at it and he said, they're just trying to scare you. He said, they're doing a good job. I gotta get a gun. The sheriff said, you don't need a gun. You, you shoot the wrong person, you shoot yourself. Finally, the sheriff gave in and said, okay, go to the pawn shop across from the courthouse and get a 38 police special, Smith and Wesson. And you know, and this is good advice. If you got an amateur who's gonna get a gun, make sure they get a, a revolver. You know, but an automatic will jam on them or they won't know how to operate. And revolver, all you gotta do on a revolver is point and pull. So he told him, point and pull. He said, now once you get the gun, go down to Billy's welding shop on the east end and have them file the gun side off. And so I said, what's, what's that? He said, it looks like a little BB. It's on the end of the barrel. That's what you side it with. And he said, well, why do I have them file that off? He said, that way when they take it away from you and stick it up your rear, it won't hurt so bad. I always like that. Uh, Swartz looked at him and said, are you saying I don't need a gun? Yeah, I'm saying you don't need a gun. Swartz, we served with a, a guy named Ralph Hall that was from the, this area. And I, anybody from Rockwall or uh, know Ralph Hall, wasn't he great? One of the best of all time. And uh, Ralph is a colorful guy and you could not, you could not say something that he couldn't, he could sidestep you. Just keep, I mean, nothing, so, he was good on his feet. We flew back, I was in Congress representing Lubbock, he was representing Rockwell in East Texas. And uh, we, uh, we got off the plane at DFW, and I was gonna have to go catch another plane to get to Lubbock, and he was through, and we're walking down the concourse, and somebody said, Congressman, Congressman. And uh, we turned around, and I didn't know the guy, and Ralph went over and gave him a slap on the back and hugged him and, and introduced me to him. And he said, this is Congressman Hans from Lubbock. And he said, uh, this guy uh, lived next door to me in Rockwall uh, for a long time. And he said, he'd been gone 10 years or so, and the guy said 12. And Ralph was talking along, and all of a sudden Ralph stopped me. He said, I forgot to ask, how's that beautiful, charming, vivacious, cute, intelligent little bride of yours? And so well, I said, I divorced her about six, six months ago. Ralph said, you're better off without her. You know, just slapped him on the back. Never missed a beat. Is that good or what? I, you know, I'm over, I'm over there biting my tongue just thinking, God, oh my God. And, and the guy walked up, and I said, Ralph. He used every adjective known to mankind to describe her, and then you said, he said, well, I need to make him feel good. You know, it just, ne it did not phase him, did not phase him. And uh, he could recover for anything, he, he, he was the best. Uh, the other person I want to mention that was unusual, and do I have any from, any builders from the Permian Basin? Uh, they, they probably stayed out late last night. <laughs> not, not, not her. W one time, I spoke to the Desk and Derek Bosses Night in Midland, Odessa, and they had like a thousand people there. And I knew it was gonna be a fun group. It said cocktails, five until eight. Boy, I'm telling you, they were loose. I mean, I, I, I got up there and said, hello, and they just laughed, you know, I mean, they were. And they got ready for the program and they were really loud. And a woman got up to give the prayer, the opening prayer, and she had on half glasses, you know, half rim glasses. And so she read the prayer and she had, to, she had her head kind of back like that and she was praying. 
and it was noisy. And somebody at the back said, Honey, we can't hear you back here. And somebody at the front yelled back and said, She's praying. The guy at the back yelled, said, Hell, we still can't hear. <laughs> and she really was good, not as good as Ralph Hall, but she's good. And she said, and, and Lord, do something about the drunks in the back. Just <laughs> quiet them down, son, quiet them down. But uh, Midland and Odessa, when I was a state senator, I represented Odessa, but not Midland. And, and it, you never wanted to represent Midland and Odessa. You wanted to represent Midland or Odessa. But if one of them got a post office, the other one had to have a post office. And if one of them got a new such, such built, you know, I mean, it, it, there are a lot of competition out there. And they were, they had established the University of Texas at the Permian Basin. And uh, when, uh, when they did, the fight was on, on who could get it, Midland or Odessa. And so I was representing Odessa, and I told the guys that were trying, I said, this committee You've got Oscar Mousey, as vice chairman, and Babe Schwartz, as chairman. You've got a couple of liberals on there. You've got to have somebody that's pretty hardcore liberal to, to testify, try to get those two votes. And I was trying to, you know, in, in politics is a business, and I'll get to that in a minute. But, but you, we had to have, I think there were nine on the committee, we had to have five votes. And so they said, we got a guy named Warren Burnett, and he was a litigator, trial lawyer. Good, good. He'd been district attorney at one time. Had a gravelly voice. He, boy, I mean, he, juries loved him. And uh, Warren Burnett was president of the ACLU. That's for the liberal. And uh, so they said, we'll get him to come testify. And I said, well, Warren was known to have a liquid lunch on occasions. And he was really uh, in the fast lane after about two o'clock. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll just get, I'll, I'll use my friends there and we'll, we'll get that in, in the morning. So I had Schwartz set the committee meeting at 10 in the morning. And uh, it's 10 in the morning, and that way, you know, I'd be, be okay. Wouldn't have that liquid lunch. And he, uh, he got there, and I, I got over and, you know, said, be sure, and I outlined what he needed to say and everything. And, and they got a bunch of witnesses going from some other towns, and they didn't get to him. And they had a lunch break. I was worried. He came back about 1.30. I went over and gave him a hug. And he had had a drink or two. I said, Warren, don't say anything controversial. Just tell him we need, okay, okay, hell, I know what I'm doing. You know? You think I didn't win all those cases on knowing how to, there's nothing more than a jury. Okay, okay. He got up there and did a, a masterful job. And then Senator Schwartz asked him a question. He said, uh, Mr. Burnett, do you think there's a need for a four-year college in Odessa, Texas? And Warren said, Mr. Chairman, there's enough ignorance in Odessa to justify an eight-year college. I'm telling you, the Chamber of Commerce director, I, I thought he was going to die <laughs> of a heart attack. To the day he died, any time I saw him, he'd say, you never got that school if it hadn't been for me. <laughs> and uh, he was a colorful guy, colorful guy. But uh, I, I want to talk to you a little about politics, how it's changed. When I was in Congress in the 70s and 80s, if somebody came up to me and said, who do you hate? I don't hate anybody. If you ask now a, a member of Congress, who do you hate? You've got to pull up a chair. It's going to take a while. Uh, President Reagan. I loved Reagan. I'm 
He was the best. He was the best. And, and the press tried to portray him as he just some actor that didn't know anything. He was the best I've ever seen at cutting a deal. See, babe, a lot of people don't understand about politics. They think the decisions are made by people to get on CNN and Fox. Those, those are not the ones. That, you know, they can get on talk and everything. But you got workhorses and show horses. And the show horses don't, you know, they're not the ones making the deals. Um, I carried Reagan's tax cut. Phil Graham carried the budget cuts. And at that time, we were conservative Democrats, bow weevil Democrats, and Reagan had to have some Democrats that would carry his bill so he'd get Democrats to vote for it. We had 78 Democrats vote for Reagan's tax cut. You, I mean, you couldn't get one in this day and time. But Jimmy Baker was Secretary of State uh, under Bush later, but he was Chief of Staff for Reagan. And he called me and he said, the president wants to get some of the conservative Democrats up here uh, at a group of five to 10 at a time so he can work on them and wants you to bring them up since you're cutting, you're, you're carrying the bill. And so I, I got together and made a list with Baker of who we wanted. And the first group, uh, I took seven up. And we go in. And President Reagan came in, and he was, he was great. One-on-one, -on -one. He, he, he made you feel like there might be somebody that he thought more of in the world, but you wouldn't figure out who it was. I mean, he was just charming. And so we got started the meeting, and he looked over, and there was Congressman Billy Tozan from Louisiana and Congressman John Bro from Louisiana. And he said, guys, I got 72% of the vote in Louisiana. Y'all got to be from a tax cut. And bro said, well, we'd like to. But you're going to lift the sugar import quotas, and that's going to kill our sugar cane farmers, and we can't vote for it. And Reagan said, well, what if I don't lift those? Rose said, yeah, we'd vote for it. And Reagan just grabbed his hand and shook it, and he said, you got a deal. Well, look, the, the tax cut affected everyone in the nation, the largest tax cut in the history of the country. The sugar deal was a fight between the soda pop people and the sugar farmers. You know, it was important, to, but, but look, it was very small in the big picture. So he picked up two votes just like that. And, and then, you know, I mean, he, he understood what the deal was. And then they had uh, uh, several others, and out of the seven we invited, six of them agreed to support the tax bill, the tax cut bill. And uh, so uh, they, they asked me to take them out on the West Portico and have a press conference. And West Portico, Press is always out there circling, and we tell them, they tell them there's going to be a press conference in 30 minutes. And so I go out, and oh, by the way, six out of the seven committed. The other person that didn't commit had to go out the back door. You know, I mean, you do you get better treatment. And uh, so I go out and I say, uh, uh, on behalf of President Reagan, I want to announce that we picked up six more Democrats to vote for Reagan's tax cut. And uh, I talked about it, and then I introduced each one, and then I said, are there any questions? And Sam Donaldson with ABC, y'all remember him? Sam was just meaner than a junkyard dog. And Sam immediately, the press, if you vote for a tax cut, the, the press is always gonna ask this question, why are you giving a tax cut to these rich people? And the tax cut was across the board. You got a 25% tax cut. You know, if you were paying $100,000 in taxes, you got $25,000. If you were paying $1,000, you got $250. It was fair. Uh, anyway, 
Sam Donaldson said, uh, Congressman, talking to bro, Congressman bro, uh, why are you voting for this tax cut for rich people, this Republican tax cut for rich people? You know, and I knew that, that bro would say, because it's good for the economy, it's good for the public, everything. He said, because the president promised that he wouldn't lift those sugar quotas and kill my sugar cane farmers. I thought I wouldn't have said that, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> and Donaldson said, Congressman, did you sell your vote? And Bro said, nope, I just rented it out for a while. <laughs> and I thought, his career is over. I didn't know Louisiana politics. He went on to get elected three terms in the U.S. Senate. You know, people in Louisiana said, hey, he didn't sell it, he just rented it out a while. <laughs> they were proud of it. Uh, a lot of people, you know, the under, politics is a business. You've you got to be able to get elected and you've got to be able to serve. Th there are some people that can do both. That's a small group. There's some people that are really good at campaigning, but they're not good at serving. Jimmy Carter was a great campaigner, but it, it, it is getting things done and, and, and getting it operating. He, he just wasn't. Uh, you know, uh, Bill Clinton was pretty smooth. Bill Clinton was, was, I would say he was even smoother than, than Reagan when it came to meeting people and, and tell them what he felt like he needed to tell them. You could be at the White House and, and somebody would be going through the line and say, Mr. President, that banking bill that passed is terrible. And, and Clinton would go, oh, I know, I know. I, you know, I cringe when I read it. I cringe when I read it. And they'd go on. About three land, the guy come by and say, uh, Mr. President, I sure hope you sign that banking bill, boy, it's needed. Oh, I understand that, I understand. He was, you know, uh, John McCain and I were at a conference one time and Clinton introduced him and McCain said, he lied about me, but he's so good, he said, I enjoyed it. <laughs> he said, he just made me feel good. Um, you know, Clinton was a, a liberal moderate to liberal Democrat. He wasn't a progressive. It, it, Clinton would not fit in with this White House. You know, it's just, it's, it's different. It's, it's moved, moved to the, to the left. Um, I think that, you know, the important thing for you to do is to know your member of Congress, your state senator, your state representative. No matter where you live, you have a state representative, a state senator and a U.S. congressman and two U.S. senators. And you want to know them. You know, you want to participate when they have a fundraiser go. You don't have to give a maximum amount or anything. They'll have some fundraiser you can get in for $100. And, and help them in their campaigns. Let them know you. Try to show them your business sometime. I mean, they're busy. But if they know you it's gonna be easier for you to explain what's going on. And, and they, they wanna have that input. So that, that's, it's very important. And um, there are people that, I, I'll tell you one of the best was Charlie Wilson. Charlie Wilson could put deals together. Charlie Wilson and I put a deal together with uh, the Michigan delegation on the bailout of Chrysler. And we got the Texas people to vote for that in exchange for the Midland, uh, for the Michigan people to vote to abolish the windfall profits tax, which was a terrible tax on the state of Texas. The windfall profits tax, a lot of people don't understand this, that was a tax on oil produced in the United States. If you produced it in Venezuela or Saudi Arabia, you didn't have to pay the tax. Now that's crazy. 
It's a reverse tariff. Most people put tariffs on goods coming in, but, but that, that one was one where they put it on American citizens, but if you're from Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, you know, Indonesia, didn't have to pay it. And, and I've never, in and, and the public, you'd tell them that, and they'd go, well, it's hard to believe. I say, especially if you're in the oil business in Texas. But we did that deal, and, and here, here's the thing. Lee Iacocca came by and, and met with me and met with Charlie. Lee Iacocca was CEO of Chrysler. He was good, and I knew that he was going to get it turned around. If we didn't turn around, unemployment benefits, food stamps, we, we had, it was going to cost a lot of money. And the government, we made an investment in it, and three years later, they paid it back and paid $265 million that we made. The government made that. One of the few times we ever made money on anything. But it, it was a deal that made sense. And too many times the emotions uh, make it difficult to get things done. People get real emotional on something. Uh, Wilson, did any one of you read the book, Charlie Wilson's War, or see the movie? You need to go back, and, and it, it was a great movie. And uh, Tom Hanks played Charlie, and Charlie said, they should have gotten somebody a little more handsome. Charlie, have you looked in the mirror? Uh, but, but Charlie Wilson always had uh, a few girlfriends, and some of them would be in their 20s. Those were the old ones. Uh, and he was known to have a drink. And one time he tried to take Miss March of Playboy magazine on a congressional junket with him. He said it'll help the morale of the troops. And uh, Navy wouldn't do it, and he cut their budget next time. <laughs> Charlie played hard, hardball. But uh, in that movie, you just see how the Russians lost in Afghanistan because of Charlie Wilson. And Charlie told everybody, he said, you've got to have somebody in Afghanistan or the crazy, crazy people, terrorists will take over. And the United States wanted to get out and they just got out. And, uh, and just, you know, we, we didn't follow through, which later became the second time we just got out. Uh, some of my friends that are more libertarian, they talk about U.S. shouldn't ever have troops anywhere. What about Germany, Japan, and South Korea? Three of our greatest allies, and we still have troops there. And they set up democracies. So I'm not saying we have, have troops everywhere, but you have to look at those things. And, and that's, you know, that, that's very important. Um, Texas delegation, you've got some people that are in position, if the Republicans take control, the chairman of appropriations will probably be Kay Granger from Fort Worth. It's a powerful position, powerful position. Uh, the chairman of, uh, uh, of the uh, Armed Services Appropriations Subcommittee with John Carter uh, from Georgetown, and the Chairman of Foreign Relations probably be uh, Michael McCall from Austin, and, and those are powerful uh, positions, and that uh, they have a chance to serve a long period of time. Out of 435 members of Congress, there's not but about 35 um, that that are contested races in November between Democrats and Republicans. So it means that the other 400, you've got to get elected in the primary. And if you're a Democrat, you've got to be careful you'll get beat from the left so everybody moves to the left. And if you're a Republican, you've got to be careful you get beat from the right, and you've got to move to the right. And the result is it's harder to compromise. When Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, totally different. Conservative, Republican, liberal, Democrat. Tip got 
met at Reagan one time and he said he's got terrible advisors. And Reagan hit him back real hard and he said he's ill-advised. You can say that about people that, and, and that night meet with them and work out a compromise. Pelosi called Trump an idiot and he called her a loon. It's hard to work that out at night, you know. It, it, I mean, it's difficult. And one of the things happened with, with, if you take CNN and Fox and MSNBC, the more sensational things you get on to say, the more often you're going to get on. And so, and people see, and, it, and it's hard to work things out. Uh, there was a program, and, and I do these programs, and, and I'm sure there's builders in here that do, low-income housing tax credits. And uh, that passed during Reagan's administration, and there was, uh, it Pat, Tip O'Neill, Jack Kemp, and Ronald Reagan were the ones that pushed that thing through. And it passed in the House 415 to 1. And it passed in the Senate 98 to nothing. And since then, R Reagan started it. George H.W. Bush supported it. Bill Clinton supported it. George W. Bush supported it. Obama supported it. Uh, Trump supported it. And Biden supported it. And, and that was a program that's worked, worked well and was trying to get private sector involved in public housing. And, and it's helped the public, and it's worked. So you can do things uh, that, and when, when I was in Congress, we tried to, on foreign policy, tried to work together. And that, that, was, that was very important. Uh, the, another big change is journalism. Journalism is dead. And I'm sure I offended any reporter that happened to be here, and, you know, I'm just telling you, it's dead. Remember, you used to get up every morning and get the paper. Now, you still do that, or you can get it online. But every politician went to see the editorial board of the Dallas Morning News, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, the Beaumont Enterprise. They don't go see them anymore. They're insignificant. They're not players. And the press... Here's how it's made up. It, it used to be they were slanted to the left, but now they, there's not a slant. I mean, they're just wholeheartedly. If you take newspapers, if you take Washington Post, L.A. Times, New York Times, you know, those in Associated Press, they're going to lean to the left. I mean, they're just biased when you read them. If you take TV, Fox is to the right and all the rest of them to the left. If you take talk radio, they're to the right. And, and you know, I try to listen to everybody and, and watch everybody from time to time just so I can figure out, you know, what I think's going on. But the real journalists uh, are no longer, they're, they're no longer involved uh, where they're trying to find out exactly what the story is, what's both sides saying. You know, you, you've got to be alert and to try to figure it out on your own. And, uh, and that's sad uh, that, that that's happened. Newspapers don't have the, they just don't have, people don't read them like they used to. And, uh, but I, I remember, you know, 30 years ago, big thing, you, you wanted to get a newspaper. The reason newspapers were in, they'd give you an in-depth coverage TV station, they'll give you a sound bite that'll last 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You know, and, and television changes. Used to, the TV stations had to have some programs that were for the public. And they'd, have, and they'd do them on Sunday mornings before the preachers would get on. And they'd always interview the congressman and trying to be in good with you. And, the a Lubbock station interviewed me one time. They recorded and they and uh, they they interviewed me. And the the anchor was was supposed to interview me. Uh, the the weekend anchor and there was a one car rollover west of Shallow Water and he had to cover that. That tells you how important it was at my interview. And uh, 
something happened to the backup anchor, and they had the weekend weather guy interview me. It's the dangest thing I've ever seen. He, the, the, he got there, and, and the red light came on the camera. He said, today we're honored to have Congressman Ken Hance, and he told a little about me, and, and he said, Congressman, I'm glad to have you on the program. And I said, I'm glad, glad to be here. He said, what's been going on? That's his first question. What's been, that's kind of open-ended. So I talked, and I'd pause to let him get in the conversation, and he'd just look at me like an owl, just blink. So finally, I just stopped, and he came with his second zinger. What else been happening? <laughs> And finally, I got him on his third and last question. He said, what's going to be coming up? <laughs> I thought to myself, uh, he really shouldn't go into journalism. He needs to stay with the weather. Last time I checked on him, he was selling appliances in Abilene. Uh, Butler, you might want to go check on him, see how he's doing. Uh, home building business, big business. And you have some ups and downs. Uh, Bob Perry always told me he is a good friend. Bob Perry did something for me. I ran for governor, and Clayton Williams ran for governor, and, and Clady spent $23 million. I would have set a new record for a Republican. I spent three and a half. He spent 23. Hey, this is a retail state. If, you, if, if your competitor is selling houses and he has seven ads on TV and you've got one, wonder who will sell the most houses. You know, he's going to sell more houses. And uh, I got beat soundly and Bob Perry came to see me the next day and brought me a check. Nobody, when you lose, nobody gives you money. He brought me a check and said, I appreciate all the service you've done in Washington everything, and I know you'll have some, bit. he gave me a $25,000 check. Boy, I mean, that, that said a lot, but there was nothing, it wasn't going to help him or anything. He just appreciated me running, and, and, uh, and, and, I, and I appreciated him. Uh, but uh, you provide a lot of jobs, and that uh, home building business is a competitive business. Talk about free enterprise, idiot. You, you got to get out there, and you got to compete. And, uh, but when you finish a house, the joy that you get from seeing people move in, and, and some of them are custom homes, some of them are houses that uh, are starter houses. And uh, those, those are so important. And that it's important in, in the home building business, they usually are active in politics. They have a, enough members that are active. And there's, there's always some that don't get active, uh, but uh, you, you should be very active in everything you do. Um, I would uh, be more than happy to take any questions uh, that you might have about current politics or current, you know, wh whatever. Uh, Let's give a round of applause to uh, Ken Hass. That was awesome. That was awesome. We got time, if you're okay, for a few questions. Um, there's some mics out there. If you have a question, raise your hand and uh, We'll, uh, we'll let you ask it. So while you're pondering, I have one. Um, you worked, or you've had the opportunity to serve at multiple levels, statewide office, Congress, Texas legislature. Talk about, um, you know, we're heavily engaged and you still are in the Texas legislature. Talk about the difference uh, between the Texas legislature and Congress. If you uh, Texas legislature, it's not a political party battle like it is in Washington. In Washington, Obama couldn't get one Republican to support it, you know, uh, on a vote, and Trump couldn't get one Democrat. I mean, the bipartisan deal, they'll say it from time to time, but it's, it, you know, when it's tough, it's not. But in the legislature, uh, you, you know each other. In the, in the state Senate, I was one of 31. You know, I knew those people. I mean, they... I knew their children, and that uh, I spoke at the wake for a, a Swartz. You know, I'm a conservative Republican. He's a liberal Democrat. 
but we were still friends. And, uh, and it wasn't personal. See, I never did take it personal if somebody had voted for or against my bill. They've got, they've got to deal with their constituents. I had a guy in Midland one time said, if you see Pelosi, slap her. Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> you know, I mean, what are you thinking? Uh, you've got to, anytime I need somebody's vote, I try to think, with their district, is there some way I can get their vote? I, I had to have Roy Harrington from Port Arthur, I had to have his vote one time, and there was a bill he had, had to do with regulating alligator hunting. And it was a big deal to him. I'm from Lubbock. <laughs> alligator hunting? I could vote any way I wanted to. And he needed my help. He later was a sponsor uh, on the funding, for additional funding for the Texas Tech Medical School. There's some dead alligator out there probably mad about it, but so what? <laughs> <laughs> that alligator's gonna eat somebody's kid or something. We got I can justify that vote. I, I dang sure can Lovell uh, or Odessa. They'd say, that, that sounds like a good vote. But, but you, you, you use the, Charlie Wilson was good at it. He'd, he'd figure out, you know, the chip. LBJ was a master at it. Reagan. Reagan, he took me to Camp David twice. And, uh, boy, it's hard to vote against that. Takes you to Camp David twice. And, uh, but he needed someone in a leadership position uh, in the house to help him in that, that tree. W one time it was in the front page, he showed us landing. Front page of Washington Post. Phil Graham called me and he said, what, you went to Camp David? And I said, yeah. And he said, you took some people. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, why didn't you take me? I said, you're already committed to vote for my bill. And he said, well, I'll never commit early to you again. Graham turned 80 this week, and he's doing good. He had a tough bout with cancer, and it's, uh, it's gone and it hadn't come back in six years. He has to have a checkup once a year, and Graham said, the week you have the checkup, you don't sleep real well until afterwards. Uh, but uh, he gave a lot of service uh, to this country. Sure did. Any other questions? Come on, anybody? We got him here. I see one. Right over here, Mr. Carter. Jerry. Wait, hold up, Jerry. We got a mic. Thank you, sir. We we certainly enjoyed your stories this morning. But um, many of us in here have work actively with you know in in dealing with our our leaders, whether that was community or state or national. And uh, many times people come in uh to when we go in that people we're against this 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 and sometimes people come in and say uh here's what we're working on and we know you're working on it what's your opinion on that and how can we help you to get to our resolution how would that be a difference in your response to those two ways of dealing business? well I, you know i think you can be effective either way but look, if somebody came into my office and said, here's what we're trying to do, and we've heard that you're support, what can we do to help you? You know, and, and here, here's one other thing I always like, they come in and say, how can we help you on this bit? We, we want you to vote for it and everything, but if, can we answer any questions that'll make it easier for you to vote for it? I had a bill one time they were trying to pass that, that you could sell, this was in 75, that you could sell liquor in a grocery store. Liquor and beer, and they were against it, you know. And in Lubbock, I was against it. Hell, it didn't sell it anywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was easy for me to take a position on that, and somebody came in kind of from the other side, and they said, uh, this guy asked me, could you take a walk when that boat comes up? And I never took a walk. You know, sometimes they get somebody to take a walk and they wouldn't be there and that, that would help, help the other position. But I think when you go in and, and you say, you're, you're trying to identify with them, just like you said, 
I think it helps, it makes it easier. That, that would be my position, uh, that my recommendation. Uh, I, th I think it's a good, good point, good point. All right, one more question. We gotta get this show going. Anybody else out there got one? Oh yeah, that's a good question. From uh, a lady over here that maybe used to work for you, Miss Yuri. L Lorraine Yuri was my office manager in, uh, in DC. She went up there as a teenager almost and, and, uh, and she became office manager for that. But this is a funny story. People, she was in charge of the mail and she got a letter, I got a letter from her mother asking me to vote for some bill. And she told her mother, people have to answer those letters. You know, she's having to answer the letter. And she's, you don't need to do that, mother. You just call me. I always like that. She, she that's funny. She uh, has a question. How did you get into podcast deal? I got into podcast, Skip Hollinsworth. Anybody know Skip Hollinsworth? He writes for the Texas Monthly. Somebody told me I ought to write a book of different stories I'm going to, but he said, Hans, you ought to do a podcast because your delivery and your voice and everything, the way your West Texas accent, he said, you ought to do a podcast. And uh, we did, and I've enjoyed it. I don't have much time. I'll do, I do them, I record them on Saturday morning, and, um, and I have a saying of the day, one of my favorite sayings. I, I'll give you a couple of them. Trouble rides a fast horse. I'm telling you, it does. Boy, if trouble comes, it, it, I mean, that horse will be going fast. You know that. And the other one I like, no matter how thin a coin may be, it will have two sides. You need to remember that in politics. Uh, best people understand things in politics uh, usually are lawyers because in their professor, profession they say something and somebody says the opposite. The people have to adjust to it and they have the hardest time are doctors and professors because they're used to talking to a group and they tell them something and nobody questions them. So it's hard for them to come in the legislative process, but most, you know, a lot of them adjust and, and do well. But uh, the podcast uh, comes out on Monday morning, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We have little snippets. Uh, that'll be some of the stories, like the Warren Burnett story, been the enough ignorance, no destiny, you know. When he said that, I was looking at the president of the Chamber of Commerce in Odessa, and I thought he was going to either die or go over there and choke poor old Warren to death. Uh, it, was, it was pretty funny. But that's how I got into it, and I appreciate you listening to it. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the home builders, and that I know what you go through. Uh, I went through it. Uh, some of the same same things. But remember, there's money to be made on representing those subcontractors. <laughs> Let's give it up for Ken Hans. <laughs>